Okay. We'll go ahead. This is episode number 26 of the Serious About Security podcast for February 8th, 2013, sponsored by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. Uh, we're trying this in a new format today with Google Hangouts. Uh, so if you're listening to this, then you could find the video version of this on YouTube. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce the host of today's podcast. I'm Preston Wiley, CISSP CCNA. This is Keith Watson. And I'm Mike Hill, CISSP. So we'll start off with the articles today. Uh, the first article is mine. And it is about uh, the Homeland Security issuing a notice to users that they should disable their universal plug-and-play service due to uh, vulnerabilities within it. And we do have on the links a, vulner uh, a link to their vulnerability note. Um, and just to, to, to uh, give listeners a, a understanding of what universal plug-and-play is, is it is a um, basically a standard a standard for um, opening ports uh, on a uh, like a, a firewall or whatever so that a, a device uh, when plugged into a, uh, a network can communicate with the internet and and essentially uh, uh, have ports open for it so that um, so that uh, it can communicate. Um, and uh, apparently there's vulnerabilities in it that would allow an attacker to essentially have um, basically uh, unrestricted access to an internal network that obviously they shouldn't have. And uh, I think this article is interesting because the Homeland Security Department seems to be taking a pretty uh, active approach on on. Uh, giving information to you to you end users about security vulnerabilities and the last one article that I believe we talked about was the Homeland Security Department warning users about a Java vulnerability and now they're they're coming back just a, a few weeks later and saying oh look you should also disable your universal plug-and-play and I think that is a very very good thing uh, that they're doing, and I hope that they continue to do this more in the future. So, what do you, what do you guys think of this? Well, uh, it is a change from what we've seen. Typically, they've sent these notifi notifications, like you mentioned. Mostly, it's been to people in industry, and not so much the uh, the end user or the the home user, if you will. So, this is definitely uh, a good thing. Um, uh, specifically with this case, I mean, if you think about it, most people have some sort of uh, device connecting them their house to their uh, to their ISP, whether that be like a Comcast cable modem or DSL router or something like that. And so, uh, there's a, quite a few of these devices out there, and and most of the modern ones do have this turned on. And so, the fact that it's uh, that some of this Universal plug and play can be actually queried over the WAN side of the interface is, is really disturbing. So it's definitely something you want to make people aware of. I, I'm a little concerned about telling people that it's a, a problem because what are they? How are they going to know what to do to change it and whether they have an issue or not? I mean, we don't typically uh, when people install their modem device, they're not you know specifically looking at a lot of the configuration options and if it's one of those configurations that's on by default typically people won't turn it off because they're not sure if that's something they should do so you know this is one of those things where the vendor needs to be informing people but then how are they going to do that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of problems here that, you know uh, with trying to get the word out and then figuring out how to tell people how to cr make the correction yeah, to be to, to be clear, this isn't a problem like uh, with the operating system like Windows or or Mac OS X. This is a problem with Universal Plug and Play itself, which is not, which while it is kind of part built into many operating systems, the problem is at the at you're basically the internet entry point to your your local area network, so your router and uh, people. You know, people. There's a f only a few operating systems. Well, there's a lot of different 
manufacturers of routers and a lot of people have routers that are supplied to them by their their uh, internet service provider and sometimes they don't even allow them to get access to the uh, routers to update yep. or don't Definitely. allow them to update them yeah totally and, and and they're confusing too if you've looked at you know the the ones that have been out in the last few years have been a little easier to figure out but if you go back five or six years, those things are very hard to configure out for somebody who's not familiar with the technology. Yeah, and you know, they're almost always enabling the universal plug and play by default as well. Um, I, uh, I was actually, when this came out, I went back and looked at my router. I've changed routers a couple times and uh, sure enough, it actually, I was surprised that left it enabled. So I quickly disabled it, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of folks, um, you know, they may not be able to get in there and configure their routers or they uh, um, they may just not know how to so um, you know I, I think as vendors you know I, they like to enable it so that people can just you know plug it and, and play you know as the name implies you can just hook it up and it'll work but uh, in light of these sorts of things they should probably start releasing them so that it's not on by default I think it's interesting that the uh, Rapid7 guys who uh, currently make products based on Metasploit uh, were the ones that, that discovered this and then produced a paper about it as well. So that's, that's good to see that they're, you know, they're actively out there looking for these sorts of issues. Um, typically, you, you don't necessarily see that from tool vendors. Uh, they typically provide the tools. Uh, but in this case, they were actually active in helping find this issue and then helping alert others about it. So, you know, kudos to them for that. Well, I think you, also universal plug and play has kind of been on the radar for a long time. It's not, it's not a new kind of thing on the security researchers radar. It's been, I think, a problem ever since it's been released as, you know, it doesn't really have any authentication or anything like that. Basically, if you, you're on a local area network that has universal plug and play, you can essentially open ports on a firewall without really any any uh, authentication or anything like that. So I, I think it's been it's been a problem. I've heard suggestions prior to this that you should disable it just because if you know if you have anybody on your local network, they can kind of wreak some havoc on your on your network if if they wanted to. Uh, but you know there this this is this was targeting a local network and not accessing universal plug and play via vulnerability. So do you think in the um, in the future we're going to see more things like this from the, Depart the Department of Homeland Security? Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, just a couple weeks ago they were talking about the Java vulnerability. Uh, now they're discussing universal plug and play. Um, you think they're going to be more consistent in releasing these things or is this an indication that uh, they're very concerned about this as a vulnerability? I think it's both. Um, if you go back a little bit in time, you may recall that you know, on the nightly news, uh, they didn't talk about security vulnerabilities in computer systems that people had. And then when, when, when various worms started attacking, um, that became nightly news then. And some of that, that reporting included how to prevent that from affecting your, your own computer in your home because those were uh, you know, more prominent. I think we're going to see that more, um, whether or not it's a good thing that the Department of Homeland Security's CERT team is doing it. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that's the best approach, but uh, as long as somebody's talking about it that is a legitimate source and they do it without creating a lot of FUD in the process, I think it could be very helpful. Okay, well, we can move on to the next article now. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, presidential authority when it comes to launching internet attacks. Uh, in the in the um, New York Times uh, this past week on or February third, the there was a report regarding President Obama's uh, uh, memo that described the ability of the federal government basically to launch uh, attacks against other nations and potentially other other um, non-state actors, I guess is the proper term, uh, using uh, cyber weapons. And to preemptively do that, um, 
this this kind of follows on the heels of another uh, memo that came out regarding uh, drone strikes and legitimacy of of drone strikes attacking American citizens uh, that may be part of uh, involved in terrorist activities. Anyways, this one is you know kind of what we suspected, but this is a little more official in that the federal government claims that they will use uh, preemptive cyber warfare if necessary to prevent uh, damage to US interest. So we've kind of suspected that they could do that and I believe a couple of years ago the Pentagon released a strategy paper which talked about using uh, not just cyber war and cyber weapons is the term that they used but also using um, you know if they needed to bomb some telecommunications infrastructure in another country that was causing a source of problems here in the US. Um, that was in one of their strategy documents too. So it's not completely um, new, but this is basically the memo that outlines what the government's thinking is on this. So it's very interesting. Um, the problem is that, that we don't have a good answer to is this idea of attribution. If I can launch an attack from a country that is not my own in the attempt of fooling the United States government into believing that attack is coming from the particular company country I launched the attack from um, that might draw them into attacking that country uh, and avoiding me so there's a little problem there there's also we've talked about before this idea of, of a kid in his basement being a non-state actor launching a an attack in the US and how does the US government respond to that um, especially if that is a person independent of any government so there's a lot of issues with this um, but it's a very interesting topic well I also the article does point out I think some of those issues as well but I, one thing that I found interesting about the article was that they kind of talked about the cyber weapons kind of in in uh, in relation to nuclear arms um, and and they said that they had some some cyber weapons that were so devastating that they would uh, they would treat them like a nuclear weapon in that they wouldn't they wouldn't launch them unless it was approved by the president of the United States himself and I found that kind of interesting I mean I think what they're talking about is things that would disrupt an entire you know, country like the, dropping the power or or things like that is is what I'm thinking they're talking about. Yeah, totally. But, but uh, it, it wasn't clear from 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 the article exactly what what kind of and I don't think it's ever going to be clear and, what they're talking another, about. Another and another issue we <laughs> talked about is um, just because we can launch a devastating cyber attack does not mean we could withstand our own devastating attack against us. We have a lot right. of problems right that right with that right now. Well, yeah, and that's what I wonder if we're trying to build up for kind of like the. The arms races, if you will, will build up our cyber weapons, and other countries will build up theirs, and it'll kind of be a standoff of, you know, if you don't attack us, we won't attack you, uh, sort of thing. Uh, but you mentioned, Keith, some, you know, some of the issues are with the attribution. You know, if 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 the the hacker in the basement can make the can make a major government believe the attack came from another major government. Um, that that could have some very bad consequences, you know. Where a new, where a third party, you know, kind of got these two major governments into a, a war that, you know, neither of them really attacked one another in the first place. So, um, it's you know, it, it, I didn't see anything real surprising in in this article necessarily, but uh, you know, the the fact is, you know, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, the the cyber attacks can be. Uh, you know, can cause a lot of damage, and you know, um, it, we have to be certain of who initiated the attack. I think, as as a nation, before we would retaliate. Right. Yeah. I just had a thought. <laughs> you know, the other issue is if if someone were to attack part of the U.S. infrastructure, what infrastructure would you classify as being uh, most valuable? In the sense that if somebody attacks it that we have to respond. So obviously if somebody attacked the power grid and we lost power in a significant portion of the US, that'd be a pretty major problem. 
but then how do you extend that off to other other parts of the internet you know because we're so tied to it with with most of our business and, and now social interactions so if if somebody attacked Twitter and took Twitter off the air will we be able to respond with that <laughs> just a thought I'm asking because I, I, another article that came out an activity was uh, the Twitter complaining about getting hacked um, and then some 250,000 uh, accounts or something like that were possibly compromised anyways uh, but they in their in their blog post and talking about it they talked about the fact that uh, the the Washington Post and the New York Times were attacked by China and so they're just kind of kind of claiming in a sense that they were also part of that uh, uh, attack activity I guess you could say so if you attack the Times and the Washington Post and Twitter can we respond by blowing up your country <laughs> I don't know it's not it's not a well well-defined answer question there. So well, I and I know one thing we've touched on in the past, and I don't know if uh, this was made clear. I, I doubt it was in the article, but you know, would a cyber attack prompt a physical attack in response? As you just alluded to, Keith, you know, if if we feel we've been damaged through cyber attacks, are we going to respond with our own cyber attack? Which would seem logical, but is there cases where we would just go full on and, and you know do a physical attack as well? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, and that's not clear. Um, yeah, I don't think they're going <laughs> to probably make that clear for us either. Well, well, they, no, they, sure said in the, they said in the article they're not they they will not disclose their official policy to us as as the general public because it's it's class it's it's secret top secret or or whatever classification they give it because they don't want you know adversaries to know exactly what their policy is for launching these sorts of attacks. Right, right, um, and they do post some amount of cyber strategy on the Department of Defense website um, and I know they have a strategy they have the DOD strategy for operating in cyberspace it's a policy document so there's lots of good reading out there if you want to see what they're thinking about but um, the top secret side I'm sure we'll not hear about that for a while until somebody leaks it <laughs> all right and uh, with that we'll wrap it up uh, thanks to Mike Hill and Keith Watson and Sirius and uh, have a safe and secure day.